Uh, I, I'm not sure if I'm comfortable wearing this anymore. Cosmology of Kyoto. Here I thought this would be a really obscure one. Made in 1993 by Soft Age, published by Yano Electric in Japan, then by Dinoware in the US. I found it, started figuring out how it would emulate, which, hey, that was pretty painless. Then I figured out there was a Kotaku article on the PC version. Eh, <laughs> right, well, no wonder I hadn't heard of any coverage. <laughs> okay, that's a bit harsh. They actually did make a Win 3.1 emulation bundle for this, so... Thanks, Kotaku. Don't hold your breath on me saying that again. I think it works better under Macintosh emulation, go figure. Then I found out the Los Angeles Times also covered it. And Hardcore Gaming 101. And friggin' Roger Ebert. <sighs> oh, and Guillermo del Toro says it's one of his favorite games. How did I miss this thing? It's going to be a strange review, though, because I can hardly call it just a game. At its core, it is a point-and-click adventure game, and yes, it does have an ending. But focusing on only that takes away a huge chunk of what Cosmology of Kyoto actually is. It turns out it's edutainment of sorts, too. You can go into the game's knowledge database at any time and even just watch that up by itself to read through if you really want to. There's also a whole lot more to find and try out than just what you need to complete the game. In fact, I would say a very good portion of it isn't necessary, but once again, I think that's the idea. It's more an experience than just an adventure game. Fair warning, though. If you don't like violence, gore, or disturbing imagery, best to back out now. This probably isn't the experience for you. If you don't believe me, here's a scene where a child gets beheaded! Yeah! Most games, even nowadays, tend to pretend children don't exist, or at least not let them get killed. Cosmology of Kyoto gives no fucks. Well... Actually, it might give at least a couple. It doesn't shy away from sickness, violence, death, demons, gambling, at least a prelude to sex, the whole lot. As a quick example, you can bet on cockfights. Is it necessary at all? No. But you can. There are several items you can buy, I think, that you don't need and I'm not even sure what they do. There sure seems to be a lot of ways to lose money and not many ways to gain it. I play games to escape real life. This being a 90s point-and-click adventure, death will come swiftly, frequently, and often without warning. Unlike many 90s point-and-click adventure games, though, this is hardly a setback. On the contrary, really, death seems to be just another bit of discovery in this game. You get thrown into some realm of the afterlife, which is honestly an interactive cutscene, before you get reincarnated, thrust back into the world of the living in a brand new body, right next to your old corpse to take everything back. It's a slap on the wrist, merely using a little bit of your precious, finite time on this ball of rock. I think this game is getting to me a little. You might be wondering how it determines what realm you get sent to, and the answer is, I'm not really sure. You have Karma and Gold kept track of on the sides of the screen here, but I've had High Karma and been sent to the deepest pits of hell. Though every realm seems to end tragically anyways, even the Divine ones, so... Maybe it doesn't terribly much matter where you end up. I'm sensing a theme here. Though Dragon Magazine says there's the possibility of being reincarnated as a dog, and I haven't run into that one at all. You just never know what you'll end up seeing in this game. Never mind, I ran into this when I started recording audio. Here I was hoping I'd get to wander the whole map as a dog, but sadly not. That's what makes Cosmology of Kyoto a fascinating little experience. The first two times I played, I ran into completely different events. Heck, there's two different ways to simply enter the city. One where you follow this little thing through a gap in the wall, and the other where you run into my favorite recurring character, Watanabe no Suna. He's one of the only people in this experience that gives a damn about you. He tells you to turn back, not because he hates you, but because there's demons everywhere. Though, being the essentially silent protagonist, he must assume we're going anyway, and after that encounter, bids us well. Yes, there is a text box for responses, but it won't see much use. I learned that most of the time, you just hit enter and the game eventually just treats it like you want to progress, and you usually can't back out of a conversation. Except for these two old guys, they will keep talking until you back away, which you normally can't do. I thought I was stuck. Normally I'd have a spoiler warning before now, but the game is a little bit clunky in regards to character interaction. Better to know that now rather than later. 
It was confusing Ooh. enough to me that I tried oh, the Windows yeah, 3.1 version because I thought the Mac version was straight up broken. Mostly because I ran into a review saying as much, which I think might be wrong. Anyway, you just have to say nothing. Unless I'm mistaken, which I very well may be, but it's what Ooh, seemed to work for me. Addendum, on a third playthrough, I figured out that yes and no responses actually do work. They didn't seem to before, so I just assumed they didn't at all. I must have typed them wrong or something. However, with Watanabe here, if you say yes to feeling something odd, he actually gives you his sword afterwards, the beard cutter. Otherwise, no dice there. Not that you needed to complete the game, but I ended up in several side stories on that playthrough that did require its use. You would think the manual would be a little more clear on that. So if you want to go into this as fresh as possible, go and experience it now, because I'm going over some more interesting things I ran into and in how to beat the game. I say it like that because yes, it has an end, but it really doesn't feel like the point of Cosmology of Kyoto is to complete it. You'll find plenty of people and plenty of ghosts, demons, and other creepy crawlies, but if you just rush to beat it, if you know what you're doing, it won't take long. First you make a character, and I'm not sure how much of this matters. Your name is never used, though I wonder if the other options change anything. Though varying it up over multiple playthroughs, I'm quite convinced they do nothing. Besides, they likely won't last too long, especially if you're going in fresh. Though, can I say the player avatars kind of look like me's? Somewhat more uncanny me's, but still. In between that and the 3D opening showing the guardian spirits of cities around Kyoto, or Hyanko as it was known, this game kinda started to put me off, but thankfully my fears of it being a graphical jank fest were quickly put aside once I got into it. There's still a moment or two where things start to look very... 90s again. Though the game is quite nice to look at for the most part, even when it's not depicting the nicest things. Remember how I said experiencing the game isn't really about beating it? That's because you only have to do a few things for that. You need to get the suture from Nichizo, get to the Imperial residences, flash the suture at a demon so you can steal an official's clothes, then through the Kenrai gate, and yeah. By that point you're locked into beating the game. That's it. Not exactly an enthralling tale if you dash right for the finish. <laughs> Cosmology of Kyoto speedrun win. There is a lot to discover here. With every playthrough I've had so far, I've always managed to discover a few new encounters, and I still highly doubt I've run into them all. Every time you wonder what something is, you can generally click on the resources tab up there and figure out what just happened. Oftentimes you'll get more detail on a mythical being, a historical event, a landmark, or a cultural or societal norm. But you're not just passively reading, though you can open up the reference side of things by itself at any time. When you're playing Cosmology of Kyoto, you're reading about something you ran into, something you witnessed, sometimes something you played an active part in. In my case, sometimes something entirely new I discovered because I had the means to make the story play out differently this time around. It's delightfully macabre edutainment software at the end of the day. Heck, it's even amusing when you find a new way to get yourself killed. There's an encounter where you're roped into playing a board game with a demon. As you might guess, if you lose, you die. Or if you keep dicking around, not doing anything with your turn, making them progressively angry, or they'll just kill you for being an idiot. Like I said, something new every time. Not to mention, I'm not sure if it's the game's influence or the mythologies, but I like that everything's not quite so black and white. Sure, you get warned about demons, and they do pretty much always try to kill you. Not to mention, you sure run into plenty of vengeful ghosts and the like. Not all the supernatural is that way, though. You can run into some quite affable ghosts, and there's plenty in the realm of the living that will decide to cut you down for no real reason. Heck, even some of the vengeful ghost types talk to you just fine, or just ignore you. Quite often, you're not the target of their vengeance. You're a traveler. That's what you're called sometimes. Some characters refer to you as a traveler. And given the intro to Cosmology of Kyoto, it's a little hard to know if they're talking about your avatar, the player character not being from Kyoto, or if they mean the player, you, the traveler on a psychic journey. Interesting. Honestly, as I explore Cosmology of Kyoto, there's one thing that suddenly hits my mind that I'm glad for. I'm glad a dub wasn't attempted, given the quality that 90s dubs tended to have. Not all of them, certainly, but quality was definitely not the norm. But if this is justice, then I'm a banana! Not to mention that the text translation for the 90s is honestly quite good. I can find a few little typos and capitalization errors, but that's minor, as everything tends to flow rather well, and pretty much all the little mistakes I've found are in the reference section. The writing has production value, the manual has an intro written by someone from Osaka University's Department of Anthropology, so this definitely isn't a slapdash production. Maybe that's why it took at least a year to make it to the West. It's definitely not without its faults, even aside from the clunky interactions. 
I've gotten the game to softlock more than once, making me force quit the emulator. If you were on actual hardware, you might just have to flip the computer off. Not sure. Despite all of that, I can see why it has a cult following. Cosmology of Kyoto is something that doesn't have much, if any, real equivalent. It's not for the squeamish, it might be clunky and confusing, and I definitely broke it a few times. But I still don't regret my time spent in the old supernatural steep Kyoto. This is Tanara Kurinov, signing off. Tell me- what the fuck?